Good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna keep my glass of water down here so that I can have my Marco Rubio moment later. <laughs> I'll just wait for that. Um, as Allison said, my name is Ashley Fielding. I am Deputy Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Human Services. Uh, for the last six years, I have worked with the department on legislative affairs and communication specifically. In the last couple of years, I started working on strategic planning and enterprise development, which is a bureaucratic word for our training department. <laughs> I'm here today to talk to you specifically about what our plans are with regard to communicating, sharing with you our plans for the implementation of FFPSA. Before I get started, I want y'all to remember three important things. I am not the subject matter expert on FFPSA. I am not the subject matter expert on FFPSA. <laughs> and I am not the subject matter expert on FFPSA. I am here to talk to you about how we are going to keep you informed throughout our process of developing our plans for implementing FFPSA and how we are going to use your feedback to inform our implementation. Before I get started though, I just want to take a moment to give you a little bit of information on what my background is. I'm a journalist by trade, and I'm really glad that Allison said to you in the beginning that um, transparency had been very important to me at the department because that has been a guiding principle for me in every bit of the work that I've done working for the Department of Human Services. I actually, some of you who work for the agency probably know that my Gainesville Times email address is still in our Outlook system. <laughs> it's because I have emailed the department in the past looking for information for a story I was writing, and I wasn't very happy with the results that I got from our media department, to be honest. Um, so that information is still in there, but as I came to the department, it was very important to me, not only that we always remember that we are not the owners of the information contained in our department, but we are the stewards of it, and we are required not by, not just because of the sunshine laws, to make sure that we are as transparent as we can be when the law allows, but also it's our civic responsibility to engage the public in the work of government so that we can make it better. And ever since I can remember, we have been talking about how we can make the child welfare system better. And it's important to me that the public is involved in that conversation. So, that sets the stage for moving into our work here on FLPSA. Six years ago, when I came to the department, we were on the, we had just come out of a leadership level that had sort of a philosophy around communication that when anything bad were to happen, there were these sort of mythical steel doors that we would roll down over to Peachtree <laughs> and just keep them shut until maybe it went away. Um, we had a new vision of our new leadership that we would be as transparent as possible. Now, that was not an easy task for us. Three months after I arrived, we had two very horrific and high profile child deaths. Those were of Imani Moss and Eric Forbes that exposed some serious issues and flaws, quite frankly, in our child welfare system. We had to talk about those. We also uh, were on the cusp of rolling out an economic assistance process that we had developed called Georgia One. If any of you dealt with that program, you know that it did not work very well. We reversed course in about a year and a half. We had to talk about that as well. And I believe very strongly, I will tell people to this day, uh, I came home every day and had panic attacks. But us being transparent with the legislature and with the public about what went wrong in those three instances was really integral in getting us to the reform that we've gotten to today. 
So I know that many of you remember as we evolved throughout that process, uh, Director Bobby Cable came in June of 2014, and he too had a vision. Sorry, I'm neglecting you guys over here. He too had a vision that we would be very transparent with the public. He had a more programmatic vision than I did because he remembered practice, practice models like diversion that we had implemented without involving our stakeholders and quickly reversed course and moved to, I believe, safety response after that. Um, and he remembered how the judges reacted to rolling out that plan. And so Bobby, being the visionary that I believe that he was, said, we're going to take our, our vision of transparency and our value of transparency that we've taken here with the media and the legislature, and we're going to make sure that we include every single one of our stakeholders, our foster parents, our providers, our judges, everybody that is involved in our process, we want to hear from them. And so many of you probably remember, it's a project that we still do, we started our Blueprint for Change roadshows and started using that as a forum to get feedback from every single stakeholder group. Now, here when FFPSA came along, Bobby was gone, he wasn't here to guide me, but I knew that there was no way that we could go through such a colossal change and not be very intentional and consistent about the way we went about communicating this to our stakeholders and gathering feedback. And also, I wanted to take the opportunity to use some of the lessons we have learned in our Blueprint for Change tours and spin this better and do better going forward. Now I knew that if we were gonna do it better, that we couldn't do it by ourselves. And so we engaged a group called Lexicon Strategy, um, who has probably already been in some of your inboxes and that some of you have already met, but they're also here today sitting at our front table. Uh, and you'll be able to talk to them a little bit later on this afternoon um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the work they've done for us so far in gathering information from you and informing our work going forward. I forgot where I put my clicker. Alright, so what we're going to cover today is who received this survey? Oh, we're going to have to get y'all on our list, or we'll talk about that later. Um, we're going to, we sent out an informal survey to a couple of thousand of our stakeholders. We also held some informal listening sessions uh, earlier this fall. Uh, we used that information to sort of develop our initial communication strategy going forward, and so we'll show you how that has worked into our plans. I talked a little bit about this in sort of the vision that we bring to this work, but our guiding principle for the Family First Act, specific to communications, is for us to listen carefully to our stakeholders and to consistently show how your valuable input is informing our processes and our decisions. So we sent out a survey to about 4,000 people back in August. Um, approximately 3,700 of those delivered. And we had sorry, uh, about 77% of the people who responded, responded to the complete survey. So for the people who responded, this is where they came from. Uh, we had a pretty good representation throughout the state on a geographical. Um, we also talked to people about what their role was. Um, we had a good spread across roles. Um, a lot of the people that you see in the other category down there on the bottom are CASA. So in our future surveys, we will have a specific section for those who are in the CASA role. Um, we also asked some questions about the characteristics of organizations. Um, people could identify as more than one. 
Um, I, you can see right here that a lot of folks identify as nonprofit, which is obviously not a big surprise to most of us. We also gathered information on the age of our respondents. Um, this is a pretty representative sample. Uh, the majority of people were somewhere between 35 and 54. Uh, we also gathered information on the race and ethnicity of our respondents. This is also uh, pretty representative of our, of our state, so we were happy with that. Uh, we also asked our respondents what their gender was. This is pretty representative of the people who work in this field on a uh, demographic basis, at least on the demographics I'll see of our department. And then experience, we had a lot of experience in the people who work in child welfare. Uh, the average was 12 years, but we had some people who responded who had 50 plus years of experience. So in addition to the survey where we got some sort of quantitative uh, results, we also held some listening sessions so we could sort of flesh out um, what people meant by things and kind of get into some of the nuances of their responses. Uh, I'm going to just keep moving. Um, so we had about four of these listening sessions throughout the, um, we had four listening sessions and um, DFAX was not present in the room. Um, we divided folks into two groups, <coughs> care, they were directly involved with the care of children and families, or policy, folks who were directly involved in like legal or case work. Um, what you see on the screen now is some of the groups that were represented in those listening sessions. Um, thank you if you participated in those. Your input was valuable, and I'm gonna, I hope I show you today that it was useful to us. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, what we heard as it relates to communication and how we will use that in our communication strategy going forward. Um, first question, how much do you know about Family First? With a scale of one to 10, what we learned here is that we have a lot of work to do in informing our stakeholder groups about Family First. Um, we separated folks um, just to see if there were any disparities depending on your geography, um, and, and several different uh, categories. I'm going to go through some of those so that you can see whether or not there was any disparity in those groups. And you'll see that there were pretty much everybody is in the same in a lot of these categories. So I'm going to I'm going to click through these sort of fast. So by role and by zip code, um, what we learned was our own DFAX case managers and foster parents feel they know very little about the app. So we have work to do internally as well as externally. Um, when it comes to what we're doing in Georgia to roll out Family First, folks know even less than just the general federal law. And then how much do you know about what Georgia's doing depending on your role and your zip code? Same thing as before, caseworkers and foster parents feel like they know even less. Um, Generally, in these listening sessions, um, we heard that it was a philosophical, a colossal, a seismic shift in that people really want to hear about. What we learned is people are hungry for knowledge, and so we've got to find a lot of ways to talk to them and get keep them in. Um, then we also talked about what have we done in the past that, that worked well for you. Um, and what we learned was that historically people like in-person meetings. Uh, we uh, also asked for some other effective communications. No surprises here, texting, trainings, um, group meetings, we heard a lot about. Uh, people like face-to-face -face interaction. Um, folks crave open two-way communication. And uh, would like some more webinars on this because of travel constraints. Then we ask, what information do you need when we talk to you? 
and uh, folks wanted generally compliance documentation, something concrete on paper. Tell me what I have to do to be in compliance with this act. Uh, shared learnings, the ability to see what questions people have asked before, and some detailed briefings like the webinars I talked about earlier. Um, then we talked about, all right, so what, what can we do better in the future? Um, some of the things that were requested the most were in-person meetings, um, consistent email communication, uh, and a rich, well-organized website. And I'm responsible for the website, and I will tell you we've not done a good job of that in the past. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit into some of the perceptions out there and the people, the feelings that people have about Family First Act based on who they are, what their role is, and where they are. It was important for us to understand this as we started thinking about our planning going forward. We asked people about a lot of things that I'll sort of go through in a minute, um, but the big takeaway here, because I know you can't read all of this, um, is that more than 70% of you believe that we need to change the system in a major way to better serve kids and families. That's the bottom line. Uh, we asked people if we asked whether we asked them whether or not they thought their organization would benefit from Family First. We asked them whether or not they thought their organization would be harmed by Family First implementation. Um, one thing that sticks out here is that we had seven judges who responded in the survey, and uh, they definitely told us that they don't think that they were going to benefit from this, and they probably will be harmed. Uh, we had service providers who said that they definitely will benefit. And then, um, and this you will see over and over again as I go through some of these slides, foster parents were very unsure about what will happen to them as a result of this implementation. Um, so we asked folks, how much of a change is family first for your particular interest? Um, most people said it was either a pretty big change or a general change. Uh, CPAs and CCIs, uh, more than anyone else, said that they felt like this was a, a pretty big change. Uh, we asked folks, okay, now that you know what size change it is, is it manageable for you? Uh, most people said it was manageable, pretty manageable, or they just sit and know. And then we broke that down by role. Uh, group home providers, um, are most concerned about their ability to manage the change. And then again, as I said earlier, and as I will say multiple times through here, foster parents were very unsure. So these are the gaps that we've identified that we've got to close as we move forward. Um, we also asked folks, how concerned are you about the future of your interest under this new world that we're going to live under? And um, the top level responses are pretty evenly spread, but most folks said they were somewhat concerned to very concerned, and again, a lot of folks said they were unsure as well. And then we broke that down by role, um, and again, no surprises, group home providers are pretty concerned about the future of their interests. Um, and then we asked a question, and this one, we take a little bit more time to look at because this one did have some results that surprised us. Um, there was a real disparity in the level of concern between the white respondents to our survey and the African American respondents. African Americans were twice as likely to say that they felt very concerned to their white counterparts. And while I'm going to get into some of uh, the work we're going to do to respond to the rest of this, I want to talk about this one specifically for just a moment because. This is something that we definitely have to make sure that we address going forward. Um, we have a great level of diversity within our department and within our group of service providers. What we have not done so well in the past is ensure that the people that are on the front line of our communication and talking to our stakeholders, talking to the people we serve, represent that diversity. And so that is something that we have to be very conscious of and intentional about going forward. 
Uh, we asked some of the entities, or we asked entities to say whether or not they or, or identify as a city, county, or state organization, um, whether or not they were a city, county, or state organization, they all were pretty much the same level of concern. So there were really no differences in those groups. Same with uh, people who identified as a public, a private, or a large entity. These graphs will almost look exactly the same. And then there's also very little uh, disparity between our urban and rural respondents and our local, regional, and national. Now, we ask folks, what are the biggest gaps currently? Um, this work cloud, you can't see all of it, but uh, a lot of folks said mental health providers, um, training, understanding, but the one that really jumps out to me, of course, is communication. It was at the top of the list. And then we asked, okay, in this new world, under Family First, what could be new gaps that arise? And again, the biggest concern was about communication. So clearly, we have our work cut out for us here. All right, so let's talk about um, what we are going to do with this information to make sure that we effectively communicate going forward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we brought Lexicon on to consult with us and then also just help us carry this thing out to make sure that we do this successfully in terms of communications. Um, and so I want to show you a little bit about how your feedback has informed our work. Again, back to the first three things that you guys are supposed to remember. Um, I am not the subject matter expert on the technical implementation of FMPSA, but I do want to take this moment to say we heard you all on the fact that Shines needs updating, and there has been a specific budget allocation for Shines updates as it relates to Family First. Shelby and Tom are going to talk about that a little bit more in their session tomorrow, but I just wanted to put it out there that yes, we heard you all, and yes, we're aware. I just don't have the information about it. All right, so back to our, our vision around communication. You guys need to know what we know, and more often than not, especially these days, you also need to know when we don't know. Um, so we want to take, make sure that we're transparent because we're learning about this as you are, and we're working on this um, in real time. Uh, so we're going to take some time, and what we're in the middle of right now is some vision setting, what our philosophy is, what our set of values is um, as we approach the implementation of Family First, and then we will talk about the details of the technical implementation um, and how we'll inform you about that. So hot off the presses, uh, just yesterday, somewhere maybe like in the left, like 4 p.m., we launched our website that is dedicated to our Family First implementation. This will be sort of our home base of where we are communicating with you and providing you with information about our rollout plans as it relates to Family First. So BlueprintFamilyFirst.org. If you didn't get it right here, I'll have it at the end for you as well. Uh, a couple of things that I want to um, point out here is that you will see the words answering your questions all over the site because we know you've got questions and sometimes we have answers. Um, and so the, the primary function of this website is to make sure that we're answering your questions. And so one thing that I'm pretty excited about is um, the feature that we have on our FAQs. Um, when you click the FAQ button, we already have a, a a list of questions on there that we anticipate that folks will ask and that have answers there. Um, but as we get new questions, we're constantly updating these FAQs and you'll see actually a date stamp that says when it was last updated. Um, and then you can send links to each answer to folks. Every single answer has its own URL. The part that I'm really excited about uh, for this is the technology behind this. Um, some, 
Y'all may think that this is too in the weeds, but uh, we are actually using uh, software that's pretty much considered best-in-class software for customer service for websites. And I'm excited to say that because as a government employee, you never get to say that. Um, but if you have ever gone on an FAQ for Airbnb or for Uber, this is the same technology that they use. Um, and so I personally have used it for Airbnb and you get your answers. And if it's not there, it populates pretty quickly. Somebody gets back with you. And we do have that functionality on our back end. When we receive a question that has not already been answered, we have staff that are there to research and provide the answer. Here's how we know it's been successful for government. Um, the state of Tennessee brought on Zendesk to do uh, customer service for its workforce development department. They saw a 35% increase in their overall customer satisfaction. And then they were also able to track that 90% of their inquiries were solved during the first interaction. Another feature I want to make sure that you guys are aware of, and what you see here on the left is what it looks like if you were to access it on the desktop versus your mobile site. Um, but we have the support button. Uh, it uses uh, bot technology, artificial intelligence, to find the existing knowledge and information and provide it as you're typing in your question, and it'll allow you to ask me questions that will inform our, all of our work. So this is some of that shared learning that we're trying to respond to in terms of the desire we've heard in the surveys. Um, in addition to this FAQ support function, we also have um, a traditional email inbox uh, on the web that you can access via the website or just emails, but it's also tied to that same answer bot. So there's not some questions being answered over here, they're in a vacuum and questions over here. It's all being integrated together. And it will also activate the answer bot. And then in terms of our, just what I kind of consider traditional communication, I want to talk a little bit about what we will be doing with email and webinars. Has anyone received our newsletter yet? Oh good, then we'll get to sign you all up at the end of this. Um, all right, so based on your feedback, we have decided to have a monthly newsletter related to the work that's going on around Family First. Um, and then also many of you mentioned the convenience of recorded webinars. Um, and so because our data is capturing information that you are seeking, we will be using that to inform what goes in our newsletters and what's on our webinars. As I mentioned, you can sign up for the newsletter here at blueprintfamilyfirst.org backslash sign up. I'll have this on the last slide as well. And then also, um, we want to make sure that we are communicating in a variety of ways because we know that people receive information better in different mediums, so we want to make sure we cover all of our bases here. Uh, we just last week uh, finished shooting the first stages of one of our vision setting videos. Um, this will be uh, what I mentioned earlier, sort of the way that we set the stage in terms of what our values are and our philosophy is around implementing this change. And then also, um, many of you in your survey responses mentioned that the Tom's Tuesday talk was a good method of communication for you. And so we are going to use that as a specific tool to communicate around Family First. Um, if we see certain topics rising to the top in our FAQs, we'll have Tom do a specific presentation on that. You know, forgive my informality, I meant to say director role. And then roadshows. I, I talked a little bit earlier about how roadshows were really important to helping us understand the needs of our customers. Um, I was actually in Baltimore, Boston last week with a group of child welfare leaders from around the country and, um, and economic assistance directors from around the country. And one of them said, you know, we never really took the time to ask our customers 
what worked for them. And once we did, we started finding ways to improve. And we definitely saw that with the Blueprint for Change in terms of hearing from our foster parents that, oh, the per diem that we pay you doesn't actually pay the cost of raising the child that we placed in your home. So we need to actually go to the legislature and ask them for more money so that at the very least we can cover that cost. Um, but what we didn't do there was communicate back to you and say, hey, we heard you. And so the point of a lot of this will be to come back and tell you we heard you. 